everybody. Welcome back to Synthetic Biology 1. Today, we're talking about what to do when your PCR doesn't work. Let's imagine this scenario. You choose a DNA target to amplify with PCR. Some sweet gene that you just discovered. You design your PCR primers, collect your template DNA, made a PCR mix, and put it in the thermocycler. A few hours later, you take out a little bit of PCR product, run it out on a, on a gel, and nothing. Or maybe you do see something, but it makes no sense. You expected one band and you see five. Or maybe you don't see bands at all. It's just a big messy smear. What the heck happened? Well, sadly, your PCR did not work. Now don't worry, it happens to the best of us. Even Carrie Mullis probably had a failed PCR from time to time. Today, I'm gonna to talk about some strategies for fixing a failed PCR. For the most part, these will be rational strategies, by which I mean we'll make use of our knowledge of how PCR works to make an informed guess on how to fix a specific problem. Of course, the most common mistake is simple user error. You just screwed something up. You forgot to add something to the PCR mix, or you set the thermocycler wrong, or whatever. There's two ways to fix this. The first is you just try it again. This is the PCR equivalent of turning it off and turning it on again. It isn't a brilliant strategy, but it often does work. The second way is to include a control by performing a PCR reaction that you know works alongside your new reaction. If the control reaction works, then at least you know that the problem is specific to the new reaction. If your control reaction fails, this might indicate that your PCR reaction mix has gone bad. The polymerase enzyme will denature if it's left out at room temperature for more than a little while. The nucleoside triphosphates also have a limited shelf life because of those high energy triphosphates eventually break down. When you suspect that the reaction mix is the problem, there's usually no easy way to figure out exactly what component is responsible. Often the best choice is to just throw the whole thing out and start from scratch. So let's say that you've done a control reaction and that worked perfectly. What next? First, take a look at your primers. A very common mistake happens during primer design. Forward primers are almost always designed correctly, and that's because they're on the same strand as the coding sequence of your target gene, and they point forward, which is to say they point from left to right as we usually read DNA. But the reverse primer has to match the opposite strand of DNA and point backwards as we usually read. It's very easy to forget to design your reverse primer as a reverse complement of the target sequence. This only takes 30 seconds to double check and it fixes half of the PCR problems for new scientists. Next, let's take a look at your DNA template. Your first instinct might be to just add more DNA template to the reaction, thinking that this means more targets for your PCR reaction to find. But usually this is wrong. PCR is extremely sensitive. It can even amplify a single DNA molecule. Actually, adding too much DNA is a more common problem. It might be impurities in the DNA or even just lots of DNA that interfere with the reaction. So think about using less template. Next, take a look at your annealing temperature. A typical PCR will use an annealing temperature in the range of 50 to 60 degrees. As the temperature drops, the primer binds more tightly to the target sequence, but it also becomes more likely to bind off-target sequences. So, if your problem is that you see no DNA, consider lowering the temperature. On the other hand, if you see too much DNA, smears of DNA or multiple bands, then raise the temperature. You might also consider adding DMSO to your reaction, which has an effect similar to raising the annealing temperature. DMSO is a solvent that helps to stabilize DNA binding, specifically binding at GC base pairs. For this reason, people like to add DMSO specifically when their primers have lots of Gs and Cs, maybe more than about 60%. Magnesium also has an effect here. Adding magnesium can stabilize the DNA double strand, making more PCR product, but also more off-target binding. Personally, I don't usually play with the magnesium concentration. I usually just use whatever concentration the manufacturer says works best for their polymerase. 
Finally, take a look at the extension time of your thermocycler protocol. This step usually takes place at around 70 degrees, the optimum temperature for the polymerase to replicate DNA. Spending more time on this step lets the polymerase move further down the DNA strand, which may be necessary if your product is very long. On the other hand, you might have a problem with unwanted amplification products that are longer than your desired product. In this case, you can eliminate those products by making the extension time shorter, too short to replicate them. If all else fails, you may want to consider creating a good luck charm for your PCR. This might take the form of a magical rune, uh, a healing crystal, uh, a totem representing a friendly spirit, a small shrine or a religious symbol, or anything that reminds you of the importance of good luck and hope in science. Because the truth is that sometimes PCR just doesn't work and you'll never know why. But don't worry, it happens to the best of us. So until next time, good luck to you. Thank <laughs> you.